You spend upwards of 12 years interviewing a serial killer, trying to get him to give up identifying markers for one of his unidentified Jane Doe murder victims from 1994. You wind up following leads all over the country, but hit nothing but dead ends. That's what my special guest this week and I did. Yet, in late 2023, 30 years after Jane Doe was murdered, everything starts to come together, giving Jane Doe a voice and a name. My name is M. William Phelps. I'm an investigative journalist and true crime author. I've dedicated the past 20 years of my life to helping families of the missing and murdered. Join me. We're crossing the line. This is a special joint episode. I'm bringing two podcasts together, Crossing the Line and Death Calls which is hosted by a good friend of mine who you're going to meet in a minute. And I just want to say up front that the two of us worked together on trying to identify a Jane Doe murder victim of an infamous serial killer for many years, the details of which uh, I'll describe soon. And, you know, happily, there's finally some answers. I started interviewing Keith Happy Face Killer Jesperson in like 2012 for a show I was doing at the time, Dark Minds. He was uh, my secret serial killer, a raven on that show. And then I started interviewing him as part of a project. I didn't know whether it was going to be TV or book or whatever, but it turned into a 10-year interview. And I locked on to one of his victims. Uh, I called her Jane Doe Florida in the book I wrote about uh, my interviews with with Jesperson, uh, Dangerous Ground, my friendship in quotes with a serial killer. Jesperson murdered eight women as a long haul truck driver from 1990 to 1995. He gave himself up after a series of letters in which on one of them, he doodled a smiley face without even thinking about it, really. It was no plan. He... He didn't want to become some nickname serial killer, although he did love that after he did. From that one little smiley face, you know, he was tagged the happy face killer, you know, and, and not to confuse him with the smiley face killer that trumped up fake case, kind of an invisible serial killer that isn't. So there was one woman he picked up at a truck stop near Tampa in August 1994, and they traveled together to a rest area in the Florida panhandle. And this woman, he described for me as, you know, uh, blonde, dirty hair, curly, disheveled, uh, flowery dress, some kind of Native American jewelry, no shoes. She had a boom box, which he, he ended up giving to one of his girlfriends, actually. Picks her up. They travel a little while. They get up to the panhandle. He parks his truck in a rest stop. There's a mattress in back uh, of the cab. She goes back there to sleep. He goes in to get some food, comes back out. He wants sex. He tells her, you owe it to me, of course, because I'm giving you a ride. She says no. She screams. And he does what he did to like six other women before this. He put zip ties around her neck, uh, strangled her, beat her, raped her, duct taped her. Everything you could imagine that is just vile and uh, dehumanizing he did to her. Uh, killed her, and then he traveled with her for a little while. And and I'll just play a clip right here uh, from him talking to me about to, to wake her up to have her go use the restroom while I was there. And while I was sitting there on the side of this bed, she uh, woke up and had this startled look on her face and started screaming again. And so I told her to be quiet. And the more I told her to be quiet, the more she wanted to scream louder. So I put my hand over her mouth and told her, you really need to shut up. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm not supposed to have this person in my truck with me anyway. And my boss has this rat policy with the a snitch policy, they call it. If another driver sees you with someone unauthorized in your truck, they can tell on you and get $100. And so I was really skeptical about this. So I was always on my mind that I didn't want uh, any, any report on this would have been a bad report. My boss would have fired me in a heartbeat. So 
I decided at that moment I would just kill her and put her, you know, just end the whole situation. So I strangled her and put her out of misery. I she becomes a Jane Doe. And the reason is, is her body's found on the side of the I-10 in Florida by, of all things, a prisoner picking up garbage. And he is already back in Oregon. Well, when he's arrested and he starts admitting all these murders because he starts really relishing in the limelight and being this this diabolical madman, um, he talks about her, gives as much information as he can, uh, which I never believed. I, I thought he knew a lot more. But anyway, they have her skeleton, which is where Emily comes in. They have her skeleton. And at the time, before Emily and I came into this case, way back in the 90s, you know, they they put her as a white woman between 35 and 55 years of age. And they do a clay facial reconstruction of her, which n looks nothing like her, by the way. Uh, that generates no leads. You know, they do as much investigation as they can on her and they run into a brick wall. You know, Jesperson said her name was Suzette, Susan, Sue, whatever, Suzanne even. And she was heading to Lake Tahoe. That's all he knew. I met Paul Moody, kind of a forensic artist, uh, investigator from the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office and Dennis Haley, who's a, a FDLE a detective investigator, a Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So we hook up the three of us. They had been trying to get Jesperson to talk about her, to make a drawing of her because Jesperson had become an artist. He wouldn't do it because Florida has a death penalty. So I start asking him to do it without telling him I'm talking to Moody and Haley. So I kind of work behind his back with them. They tell me what to say to him, et cetera. And he does some drawings for me. Uh, you can see those online. You can go onto my social media. I have them up there. They're they're all over the place at this point. So then a big push was made to identify her, started using DNA. They they came up with some people who who kind of recognized her from the drawing and lots of tests were done and there was no match. So there's a lot of disappointment, a lot of DNA testing that went nowhere. I'm leaving out a lot, but that's where Emily comes into play here. I'm honored to have this guest on Crossing the Line. Hey, how's it going? My name is Emily Speed. I am the host of Death Calls podcast. You can find me on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And my podcast is about my experiences as a death investigator. I was a death investigator for, gosh, 14 years. And a huge part of what I did, um, not just investigating deaths, homicides, working with investigators in law enforcement, but revisiting cold cases and skeletal cases and using my knowledge in forensic anthropology uh, to work on cold cases. And this is kind of how we found each other. You know, you actually have done the work. So there are a lot of podcasts out there uh, uh, of people just reading newspaper articles and w Wikipedia um, entries, but you have actually done the exact work that a lot of people talk about. Um, that's what I love about your podcast, Death Calls, and you. So I started working at the medical examiner's office back in 2007. And when I took over all of the unidentified cold cases, it was a couple of years into my career um, at this agency. And I just became enamored with her case. And I had all of these unidentified cases dating back to the 70s. But this one in particular, I think it caught my attention first because there is a link with a serial killer, which is unusual for all of the other cold cases, but more specifically, she had everything you would need to identify her. Most of these cases are missing something. You know, you don't have DNA or you don't have dental or you don't, you know, you don't have the clothing or a good description of her behavior. And we had everything we needed to be able to match her to her name. And so I 
took over these cases. And there's a lot of people that that really became enamored just like we did, you know, that worked on it before me. I mean, this is from 1994. And so when I picked it up, I knew that in 2008, they had sent um, samples for DNA analysis to the FBI's lab, and it was entered into the national database. And let me stop you right there for a minute, Emily, because I want to explain that a little bit, because it's 2008 and, you know, her remains really, there wasn't the greatest type of DNA, explain that to kind of test. I mean, people have this image that it's, you know, oh, wow, you find a body, you, you take a syringe, you just draw out some cells and you throw them into the genealogical database and boom. But that's not the case here. It was very difficult to kind of manufacture DNA in order to do that with Jane Doe Florida, right? Yeah, it was a lot more complicated than in comparison to now. Um, you know, they give instructions, when I say they, the laboratories, they give instructions of what sections of bone are the most feasible for extracting DNA. And there's a lot of factors that go into how to get a successful profile from the remain samples that they receive. And there's two different types of DNA. There's mitochondrial DNA and there's nuclear DNA. And the lineage behind the two are very different. And, and the feasibility with getting the samples to develop into this profile is complicated. And so with the FBI's laboratory, initially mitochondrial DNA was done. But just like we're talking about, you can't just plug it in and all of a sudden it hits on a name. There's so much more behind it. There is a national database where you can put in unidentified and missing persons and you can put in, I have an unidentified, I have a DNA profile on this individual, but in order to actually compare it to somebody, you have to find a missing person that matches all of these characteristics, meaning what is a biological profile look like? Are just based on their skeletal remains, are they male or female? Are they Caucasian or what is their race? What is their estimated height? What is their age range? And all of these things that create a profile of this person, now you can look through this database, oftentimes manually back then, to find who in this region of the country is missing that matches these identifying factors. Well, and then what you have is a potential match that now you have to take the DNA from one and the DNA from the other and see if they're the same. If you don't have DNA, then you look at dental, then you look at other factors. But it's it takes a lot of time and energy to do this kind of matching. I mean, so many people came forward, so many families were checked and there was just nothing. Not, nothing was happening. You know, I want to take a quick break right now, but when we come back, we're going to talk about how she was finally identified after, geez, uh, you know, it was just last year. So it was almost, what, 30 years? And and look, getting to that place was, uh, uh, wow. I mean, there were some big moments there for a while between you and I. I remember the isotope stuff. That was hopeful. And then, you know, well, anyway, we'll talk about it when we come back. So we left off, Emily, uh, on Jane Doe, Florida, unidentified. Um, let's say it's 2020, 2019, somewhere around there, uh, 2018 even. And I remember you calling me and telling me about this isotope analysis, uh, the University of Florida stuff. And if you could just explain that. You know, something I found really fascinating is you and I were both working on her case simultaneously without even knowing each other. Um, we were for a while, yeah, for a lot of years. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I had worked with Dennis Haley on trying to do all of these DNA matches or excluding potential um, identifications. And then I worked with Paul Moody to send her skull off for yet another reconstruction with updated technology as things changed over the years to try to get a better visual of what she could look like. 
And so I had already been in it for years and you and I were introduced by Paul Moody and Dennis Haley as we did another skull reconstruction. And then, you know, this new sketch comes into play and, and then that's how we ultimately met. And I was just trying to scrounge anything I can get to try to identify her. And at the time, genetic genealogy was just coming around the corner. It wasn't being used for identifications yet. It was being used more so for criminal cases and matching, you know, potential victims to suspects and, you know, being able to close out criminal cases. It wasn't for identification. And there weren't, you know, independent labs doing this kind of genealogy work yet. So I was trying to find another method because we had done everything. At that point, she's got mitochondrial DNA profiled. She's got nuclear DNA profiled. We've got full dental uh, ready to go. We've got a analysis of her skeletal remains to give us, you know, unique characteristics of an age range and sex, race, stature, all of that. And so I was trying to think outside of the box and I consulted another anthropologist to see what can we come up with. And the thought of isotope analysis came into play. And isotopes are variations of chemical elements. Um, not to get too science nerd on you, but they're chemical elements that they have the same number of protons, but they differ in the number of neutrons. And you have unstable and stable isotopes. Unstable isotopes disintegrate over time. Stable isotopes become a signature. And there's certain aspects of the human body that that signature can be found in. And we're talking about hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon. And these are things that can be compared to the local environments. So you think about geology, right? You think about the the water of the area in which you live and the deposits in the soil and how the food you're consuming and the plants that you're eating are adopting these isotopes and these signatures based on the area in which you live. Like if you're eating meat, well, that animal was eating the grass and that animal is drinking the water. And now that's being deposited into your body. And it could be found in human tissues like bone and hair and teeth. And it can give you, uh, you know, a signature of where this person originated from like where were they born? And then it could give you also a general area of where they were more recently. And it's based on how your bone is remodeled over time, how the enamel in your teeth in childhood, maybe we'll say roughly around like 12 years old, the enamel in your teeth is pretty much set of what your isotope signature is. That's just fascinating. So, wow. Yeah. And so... I started just diving into the research and the district in which I lived didn't do any kind of testing like this. And so I had to do the research and present the literature to my bosses to say, I really think this could at least give us right. a remember. little bit more info on her. I remember. I remember it was it was it was frustrating and it was hopeful. I think you explained to me at one point, you know, this is a, a shot in the dark, really, but it could be, you know, we could hit the bullseye because, you know, you could get back the tests and, you know, you could zero in on a, an area of the country that because water supplies in areas are numbered. So we know where certain water is. Right. So so that finally gets done. It comes back. And, and what are the results? Talk about the results of that. Yeah. So we. It took a while. It took what, like a year to a year and a half before we actually got the results back. And the first answer that we got was she originated from the United States. So that was report number one. And I will say it was helpful because there was somebody, there was an identification that came into question of somebody that was foreign, that this could be who she was. So it was, okay, she originated from the United States. That was like part one. I should say, Emily, I should stop you there and say this. At one point early on, 
I mean, uh, Paul Moody, I think it was, went over to Italy to get a DNA sample from somebody. So, you know, this is a, a global thing here. But to so to have her from the United States is kind of big. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, it just it gave us a little hair of insight about her. And that was the first report. And then the second report, I think, came about three months later. So this is like a long waiting game. And I had sent them molars and a portion of her bone. And I remember that the first round of extraction of DNA was unsuccessful, so I had to send them another. And this is over time when remains are so old, and we're talking 25 years since she had died, it's really, it's challenging for the scientists to be able to do a proper extraction and be so hopeful for the type of DNA they need for these tests. And so the second round of reports came in that she was from the Southeast United States and didn't really specify that this is where she was born, but it was more of, you know, this is where we're getting the most data from. People are going to wonder, well, why don't you just throw that into the genealogical databases at the time, right? And uh, the answer is you couldn't. I approached it so many different ways. I went to the state law enforcement agency to see if we can use what they were using for their criminal cases, and I didn't get approval for that. And the newer labs that just started genealogy, you know, this was just coming around. And we were in Florida, and Florida laws, they were not bending quite yet on allowing this type of access to genealogy sites. And the labs that were doing it were so expensive that the budgets of local law enforcement, the budgets of the medical examiner's office could not sustain the price of this kind of testing. Even though it was, let's say you jump through the hoops on the, the legal side and it was allowed, well, now it's so expensive that our budget wouldn't allow it. And so, you know, it would have been so nice to be able to plug it in. But when we're talking about 2019, which is when we did the isotope analysis, that was all I had access to, um, to be able to, to get any more information about her. It's just not as simple as many people think. And uh, of course, uh, people don't understand the cost of it and the people power involved in doing that genealogical research. It's not as easy as just, you know, 23 and me and a blood sample. That's not how it works. So Southeast United States is, is likely where she spent the latter part of her life. I think the answer you gave me so this is what she had told Jesperson, you know, I'm going out to Nevada to see a friend and could you bring me? So I was focused more on that. I was going to start doing billboards with her information on it. I was trying to get people to volunteer that time and space to do that. And meanwhile, you know, this comes back and you report, oh, it's Southeast, which, okay, so it is Florida, Georgia, that area, maybe Alabama that she hung around which is where he picked her up in Tampa. And so from there, what happens, Emily? How does the case move forward from there? So from there, it kind of hit a stall. It it really didn't progress from there. At the time, 2019 is when the isotope analysis came back. You know, we sent it out to the law enforcement agency working on it. You know, we tried to come up with a plan, but once we kind of exhausted all other areas of being able to identify her other than just trying to trace back where he said she was picked up from and utilizing the facial reconstruction of the sketch, we really didn't have anything until genetic genealogy was available. Not just available, readily accessible, affordable for the agencies and approved legally by the state. And so there was a lot of hoops to jump through. And when I left the medical examiner's office in where, which I lived, it was 2021. And that was probably the hardest part about me leaving that 
agency was because I felt like I was leaving her. I felt like I was kind of walking away from being able to give her a voice. I spent more time with her remains than I think anybody did. And I just, I remember pouring myself into the reports, going through every single thing that was done on her. I wrote my master's thesis on her case to just see what what can we figure out. I mean, we knew she was between 35 and 45. We knew her height, she was petite frame. You know, there were some differences in what Jesperson used to say about her hair and what my opinion of what her hair looked like because I saw a hair mat with her skeletal remains and it was more dirty blonde. You know, it was brownish with blonde fragments versus bleach blonde or yellow the way that he drew it and that was his fantasy that was his yeah, fantasy you know, uh let's take another short break come back and wrap this up and we'll talk about who she is so it's funny i'm working out one morning I get a text from paul moody and he, out of the blue i mean i hadn't talked to him in probably six eight ten months and all it says is tune into Facebook, go to the sheriff's department. And I'm, I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? He says, it's, uh, it's Jane Doe, Florida. And I'm thinking, damn. So I'm thinking it's going to be him. I'm thinking Dennis Haley's going to be there. Emily's going to be there. The whole team's going to be there. Anybody who worked on it before them is going to be there. And they're all going to be saying, wow, wow. It's not about us. It's about her. And she's finally been identified. But that's not what I saw. And I mean, I could go on a 10 minute rant about it because it pissed me off. But the important thing is she was identified. The other thing that pissed me off was they were holding up a drawing that he did for me. He did that drawing for me, nobody else. Because at the time he did that drawing, he didn't know I was working with Paul Moody and Dennis Haley. But anyway, Emily, Explain to us what happens, how this identification finally comes about and who she is. Yeah. So we'll start with her name, Suzanne Schellenberg. She was around the age of 34 when she died. And she actually was from up north. Her family was in Wisconsin. That's just a wow moment for me. That was, I just could have never guessed that. It just tells you how much you don't know about about something until you know. Yeah. She spent a lot of time in Miami and in the Southeast United States. You know, after I had left the medical examiner's office, you know, I left in 2021, I still couldn't stop thinking about her case and wanted to do whatever I could at this point as a civilian to try and help identify her. And I reached out to the sheriff's office to say, you know, I know I'm not working at the medical examiner's office anymore. I know more about her case than anybody. I would love to continue working on her identification. At first, they were absolutely on board. They knew who I was. They knew my history and my work on this case. And they said, absolutely, we would love to have you. Let's get together. And I had at this point, a little bit more backing with funding and being able to support genetic genealogy financially if the local budgets weren't allowing it. And so I offered it. I said, I want to do whatever we can to identify her. I have resources now. Can we work on it? And they were like, absolutely. If you have the ability to and it gets her identified, let's do it. And that was law enforcement. And I know that they were working with the Doe Network to do more DNA, but it kind of stopped there. After that, I would call and check in and I wouldn't hear anything back or, you know, there would be, it would be switching hands from one investigator to another. And at some point it was kind of silence and I didn't hear anything else. And I was getting kind of antsy. Like I really, you know, I really want to help. Like, what can I do to move this forward? And then all of a sudden I see a press release that 
she was identified. They ended up using Orthrum Labs that I believe had a grant in place to be able to support medical examiner's offices, coroner's offices, law enforcement in identification of cold cases through genetic genealogy. And they went the route, and I say they loosely because we're talking about, yes, law enforcement, but the medical examiner's office where I used to work went that route. And I know that they knew I was pushing to work on it again, but that's neither here nor there. The most important thing is she is identified and they found a way to do it. Your work on this is, you know, does not go in vain. I mean, you know, uh, you, you, you did a tremendous job on this case. You were very passionate and, you know, uh, I'm just glad to see that she was identified because I didn't think she ever would be. I, I thought never. I, I mean, I agree. I think I've had a lot of um, just a lot of heartburn over this case of who she is. And I think part of it is, you know, you always hear the perspective of the murderer. You know, you hear about the serial killer. You hear about his other cases. You hear about how he tortured and killed his victims and, and it's, he wants the limelight. This is the spotlight is on him. And I think part of my obsession over this case and spending so much time with her is I want her story. I want to know who is she, you know, and not just, okay, she matches. She was around 34. The science said she was around 35. We're pretty close with our predictions on just the science side of it. But, you know, best example is her teeth were in wonderful condition to the point where she's had dental work. I think she may have even had orthodontics. You know, she had somebody that cared about her, at least from her childhood to, to young adult, to be able to have that dental work done. Um, there was part of her skeletal remains that may have given indication that she could have had a pregnancy at one point in her life based on some aspects of the the skeletal remains in the pelvis and i want to know what did she did she have a family what is her life like and i think even after her identification you still hear the old story of what he did in 1994 but i still don't know any more about her and that's what i want that is such a great great observation on your part we do. We glorify the serial killer and the victim is a white female, 35 to 40. And you make an excellent point to bring her back into the spotlight and move him out. He's had plenty of spotlight, uh, that animal. But geez, I just want to thank you for doing this. I'm so happy we did. I think we both have had so many conversations about her that it's it only feels right to talk about her now that she has a name. And we don't have to call her Jane Doe Florida anymore. You know, she's Suzanne. And maybe one day we'll be able to talk to her family. You know, I, I have reached out and it's entirely up to them. I respect any kind of privacy and boundaries that they want to put in place, but also have an open invitation if they want to tell her story and who she was. So we stop talking about him. I'm all for it. You know, I have a replica of her skull that Paul Moody uh, made for me because I had done two and a half years with the work with Jesperson on her. I go down there. I'm with, I'm with Ken Robinson, you know, the uh, my PI there, who who you know. And Paul hands me this this, this skull, and I'm like, it looks so real. I mean, it, I mean, it look it looks so real. And he's like, yeah, we just want to, it's on a, it's on a stand and everything. He's like, I would just want to give this to you because of all the work you did. I said, well, that's an odd gift, but I'll take it. You know, uh, uh, you know, it's a cop gift, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a cop gift. Yeah. It's a forensic gift. I will say, uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. It's a forensic gift. Yeah. I yeah. live in forensics and I yeah. think that's, yeah. you know, yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, Emily, Hey, it was great. That's it for this week on Crossing the Line with M. William Phelps. Of course, you can you can hear this episode too from uh, uh, Emily's point of view on Death Calls because we're gonna run it together. Until next week, be safe, be aware. 
Crossing the Line is produced by M. William Phelps, LLC, and Talk Boom Productions. Written and executive produced by me, M. William Phelps, with Catherine Law. Audio mixing and mastering by Matt Russell. <laughs>